Welcome back. This is the Tutor Wizard. I'm Adrian. Please subscribe right here. Hit the notification bell below. You'll get notifications for this series and a bunch of others on our channel. We're doing multivariable calculus, chapter 3. 3.8 specifically is Stokes theorem. We're on the home stretch, Stokes theorem and divergence theorem, then we're done. It's never done. We'll be done this class or this series and then we'll do another one. This lecture specifically, what we're going to do is Stokes theorem and an example. I say some examples, but we're trying to keep this video 10 minutes, so an example. Let's do that. All right, the only thing we need left is we're, this is essentially a higher dimensional analog of Green's theorem. What we need finally is a positively orientated surface S induces a positive orientation on a curve C, which is its boundary. For that boundary, how do we say that that curve is positively orientated? Basically, Beyonce tells us if Beyonce walks around the curve and her head is pointing in the direction of the normal vector, the surface is always to the left, to the left. It's always to the left. That's how you do positive orientation. You just follow Beyonce. Stokes' theorem is now going to say, let S be a positively orientated piecewise smooth surface in R3, bounded by a simple closed curve with positive orientation, blah, 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 this picture. <laughs> and then let F be a vector field in R3 with continuous partial derivatives, with, with its components technically having continuous partial derivatives, then what this says is Green's theorem connects a double integral over a region D to a line integral around its boundary. Stokes' theorem says that now the line integral or the surface integral of the curl of F over the surface is now going to be equal to a line integral of F over the boundary of that surface C. It's the higher dimensional analog of that. Let's try to compute one of those. All right, this is Noodles. He's going to help us recap and summarize what Stokes' theorem is saying for us. What Stokes' theorem says is this statement, the line integral of, I know, the line integral of a three-dimensional vector field over the boundary of that sur orientated surface is equal to the surface integral of the curl of F. What that tells us is, if we remember and go back in all of these derivations from the previous videos, a line integral of a vector field in space is equal to the line integral over C of F dot T, where T is the tangential vector or the tangent vector, and that's going to be what we call the tangential component of F. And the right-hand side, viewing it separately, says that this triple integral is curl dot N ds, the definition of a surface integral over vector fields, and that's going to be the normal component of the curl of F. So what does that say? Stokes' theorem says that the line integral of F over that curve, which is the boundary of S, is equal to the line integral of the tangential component of F, and that is equal to the surface integral over S of the normal component of the curl of F. What? It's saying something deep and then it gets a name, Stokes theorem. Now, coincidentally, Volker Runde, you're always right. Well, not always right, but most of the time you're right. Volker Runde, one of my instructors at the U of A, used to always say that if it's got a name, they weren't the first person to do it. So Stokes theorem actually wasn't Stokes theorem. It was Sir William Thompson, who is actually Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin proved it first, and Lord Kelvin first discovered it actually in papers from Green, the Scottish mathematician, self-made baker and mathematician. And now we can show as a consequence of this what uh, Lord Kelvin actually didn't derive, that is, made an extension of Green's theorem. So if we take that surface and we flatten it out and squish it and put it in back into the xy plane, then it would be S would become a region D in the xy plane, which is our surface now. And then the normal component to that is going to be the vector in the direction of the z-axis, k, 0, 0, 1. And therefore, in this, it gives us this derivation. The line integral over this vector field will now be equal to the surface integral over the curl of f dot n, which is now equal to the surface integral over the curl of f dot k. And if we take out the middleman, this is the statement of Green's theorem. So Stokes' theorem is a higher dimensional analog to this. Let's do an example. <laughs> I won't mention, but I was, some of these books on calculus don't explain these things very well. Example, well, if you're going to steal examples from books, maybe you should hash them out first. I guess I can, I'm lazy. But example, compute the line integral of this vector field. 
and I like the way they did phrase this question. They're making you have to know and connect to Stokes' theorem, otherwise computing that line integral will be way worse if I just parameterize the curve. So we're going to view this curve as the boundary of some surface. I've already drawn it for us. Compute this line integral if we have a vector field which is negative y squared x z squared. And C, they horribly say, I try not to do that to you, but it's the intersection of the plane z equals 2 minus y and the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. Because in previous videos we practiced doing that, but once again we're going to have, have to apply it. Draw your surface, make your bounds. What I see is the surface S is actually a flat piece or the graph of a, a function z equals a function of x and y. But in its parametric form, this is y plus z equals 2 is our surface. If I project that down, I'm going to get a circle in the plane, which is can be described in polar coordinates, so I'll cheat and prep myself, but if you don't see that, you'll just do it at the end. And then what we're going to now do first is run through quickly all the horrible symbols of what Stokes theorem and these line integrals and everything, surface integrals say, and then we'll piece together, once I see how I'm actually gonna compute these types of things, then I'll calculate the things I need for that, and then we'll start put it into the pot and start. So what Stokes theorem says is, and why I like the way that they phrase this, is to compute this, I don't want to use the definition of a line integral of a vector field in space. What I want to use is Stokes. So Stokes immediately says that that should be the double in, the surface integral over the orientated surface S. I also orientated it, gave us a hint, oriented counterclockwise. So there's Beyonce and she's on the left when she walks around. Now, it's positively orientated, and what is that going to say? Stokes says that that can be the curl of f dot ds. And you're like, yeah, so now he's got a vector on him. I don't want that vector thing there, and I don't know what he means. Well, technically speaking, first of all, we're going to do this. ds is n dot ds. So that's how you get rid of the vector on the ds. It's the normal vector to the surface. times the ds differential. That now is, by the definition of computing a surface, and curl of f is just a vector field also. So once I have this sum vector field, unfortunately it says curl f, but ignore that. It's just a vector field f or curl f. How do I compute the surface integral of a vector field? That by definition of a surface integral is going to be the surface integral of curl of f dot n ts because I use that guy. Now I've got rid of that, at least I'm a little bit closer to c computation. <laughs> now you forget, well, how do I compute surface integrals? This was, how do I compute this horrible line integral? You use Stokes theorem, check, check. That's what it says. Okay, I think I got a handle on that. And it's like, well, now I've got this horrible, I have to compute a surface integral of a vector field. How do I do that again? It's like, oh, this is our definition. You get rid of the ds by doing n dot ds, and then I'll derive that quickly again, but it's like, well, how do I compute surface integrals again? Like this, you have to compute this will be the integral over s of the curl of f dot product with who? r u cross r v d a. Where did that come from? Well, again, they keep skipping those things, but we have that <clears throat> n, our unit normal vector, is r u cross r v over the norm of r u cross r v, and you're like, who's this ds guy? How do I get rid of him now? <laughs> and he happens to be ds is r the norm of r u cross r v d a. And yeah, you're probably going to want to memorize or rewind a little bit and pause and meditate on those guys and do this step so that your mind can see the root now that we've done that, that's how you compute these horrible line integrals with all of our symbols. To compute this line integral, I'm going to use Stokes' theorem. The Stokes' theorem says that now that's a surface integral of a curl of a vector field. How do I compute vector field surface integrals over vector fields? I do this formula, which is the surface integral, a regular surface integral of curl in the normal component, ds. And then you're like, who's this ds guy? And how do I finally compute this as a double integral, which is what I really want to do? <laughs> I do this as the dot product of the curl of f dot product r u cross r v, which is our parameterization of our surface, dot d a finally, and this is our differential d u d v or d v d u, depending on how you set up your region. 
And then on top of it, they made us switch the polar coordinates and their parameterization. Ah. So now I know what I need. <laughs> Curl of F and my parameterization and that vector and my bounds, which I already have. Let's clean that up and do it. Okay, so now that I know what I need, I need the curl of F and I need the unit normal vector to this plane or the surface S. Coincidentally, I'll do the derivation. But if you watch my linear algebra videos on how to create the normal equation and the general equation of a plane, you should know that when a plane is given in a general form, the normal vector to that plane is the coefficients standing in front of x, y, z. So the normal vector to this surface is the normal vector 0, 1, 1. If you didn't know that or you want the algorithm on how to do this for a general surface anyways, I'm going to now do that. But guess what normal vector I'm going to get at the end of this tunnel? 0, 1, 1. So, Watch my other videos, learn how to do linear algebra, and I wouldn't know how to do this calculation. But you're like, I wouldn't notice, so here's the calculation. The unit normal vector that I need, and it's not the unit normal vector. We have to divide by the norm, but that's the vector I need to, you'll see in the calculation. How do I calculate this guy? What I need to do first is parameterize my surface S, and it is the graph of a function, so it'll look slightly different when it's a sphere or something. It's not the graph of a single function, and it looks slightly different. Either way, I'm going to treat it the same as I always do. I find a parameterization u and v, then I find r u and r v, then I take the cross product, that's the vector I need. And then we need the curl also. Therefore, what do I need? I need my parameterization of u v. In this case, because they gave us this surface like this, what I'm going to see is, and I'll do it in a second, I'm going to let x equal u or himself, the book says a lot of the time, but I like to practice using the two coord new variables. I'm going to let y equal v, and because z is 2 minus y, z is going to be 2 minus v, where specifically if you want, I've let x equal u, y equal v, and then z is a function of x and y, so that should be 2 minus v, a function of x and y. There I now have a parameterization. This is overkill possibly for a plane or a surface, which is the graph of a function, but for ones that aren't, this is the process we still need to do and it gets much more out of hand, so we should practice the process. Then from this vector, what do I need? I need our u and our v, the partial derivatives vectors. This is going to be equal to r u is going to be one, zero, zero, which is nice, Who's that's i. <laughs> and then r v is going to equal zero, one, minus one which is j minus k. Don't worry about it. And then what am I going to do with that? The vector I need n is the cross product. So then I need n, which is going to be r u cross, actually, I shouldn't write it as n, the unit normal vector in your notation specifically. The unit vector in your notation specifically is n is r u cross v over the norm. But this guy is what I need, r u cross r v. And that is equal to, again, i, j, k, 0, 1, 1, or it's now 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1. And this is going to give me, blocking off this, I'm going to get 0 minus 0 is 0. And then blocking off this, I'm going to get minus minus 1, which is 1. And then blocking off this and this, I'm going to get 1 minus 0, which is oh, that vector. Told you. So... If the more you know, the more you know, knowledge is power. That's one of the things I need. From that derivation, I know I need RU cross RV, whatever they want to call it. And now, look, there's not even any variables in there. It's just scalars. Yay. Not today, Satan. What else do I need? I need the curl of my gradient vector. And then, at the end of this tunnel, we still have to compute a double integral. But we're almost there. One third. Moving this stuff up, I've got some of the things I need and I'm going to recap in a second. And I like to, as you're watching me, uh, or you're shutting your brain off as I compute the curl of F, you can look at these guys instead. What that means is I'm putting together all the pieces I need to compute these horrible surface integrals and you stoke theorem. The last thing I need is the curl of F, which is also a vector. So you got to write the line over top of it or Mark Solomon will send you an angry email. This is equal to i j k partial with respect to x the partial with respect to y the partial with respect to z those two rows are always the same and then what goes in the third row of the function they gave you the, the vector field negative y squared x z squared and then how are we going to compute this 
this is now cross product. This is going to be equal to, first of all, when I do I, I'm going to get this block block. If I look, I could give you the conditions on when are P and Q, when are those components zero. If Q is a function of X and Z only, he's going to be zero. So I'm going to get partial of Y with respect to Z is zero, and then partial of Z with respect to X is zero, and therefore I'm going to get zero I, long story short, minus by cofactor expansion, blocking off this one, I'm going to get partial of x of z squared is 0, and then minus partial of z with respect to negative y squared, so this is going to be 0j, and then plus, the only one I'm going to have to compute is this one. This one says I'm going to have the partial of x with respect to x minus the partial of y of negative y squared times k, and that is going to give me the curl of our vector field is equal to 1 plus 2y times k. That's the last thing I needed. Now I have all the pieces I need. Let's put that together and compute the integral finally. All right, so now I have all the pieces in general you're going to want to memorize or quickly have for yourself so you can purge this onto your paper when you get into an exam. The normal vector to your parameterized surface is going to be ru cross rv over its length and ds is always R, the norm of ru cross v, rv da. Once I have those, I can start phrasing these line integrals and these surface integrals and how to actually compute them because they all just look like mumbo jumbo at first. I understand this. I have the integral of f dot dr over the curve c, which is the boundary of my surface. My Stokes theorem now, and I'll put in the specific details of what I have. This is the surface integral of the curl of f dot ds and then you're like well how do i compute this yes now ignore everybody else he's okay we're we already computed him what we need is this ds business guy and i didn't write it up there but who's ds ds is end that's how you get rid of it you replace ds with the vector at, or the bold script in the some unnamed textbook you replace that with n dot ds so our next move is this is the surface integral over s of our curl which is still a vector field dot our normal vector ds and now the s is just a regular differential so now this is a surface integral over a scalar function because this is a scalar dot product and it's like well crap i don't remember how to do surface integrals over scalar functions either and that's our last one and we put these two things horribly in there to simplify this and when we multiply those together those always cancel and we're just going to get ds is going to be specifically this we're going to get equals the surface integral over s of the curl of f dot product with cancel cancel i'm going to get ru cross rv da and that now is a double integral <laughs> over our surface and hopefully we know how to compute double integrals i'm going to switch to polar coordinates in a second and then we can actually compute this so the first part of this is how to remember what stokes theorem says the line integral over your vector field is equal to the surface integral over the curl of that vector field. Then how do you get rid of the differential ds with the vector ds? That is n dot ds without a vector. That's the scientific way of saying that. And then how do I get rid of ds? ds is ru cross rv da, where this comes from our parameterization. So the steps to doing this would be find your parameterization. Find the partial vectors R U and R V. Find their cross product. You don't need the length if you're going to do this correctly. Find their cross product. Find the curl, which I just now did, and now put that together. Now let's finally uh, compute that guy. All right, now finally putting all of that together, we have that the line integral of that vector field in space is equal to the surface integral of its curl, which we got rid of the ds, which is R U cross R V D A. Now what I want to see is dA, my region in the plane, is most easily described as the polar, as a polar region. So that says r goes from 0 to 1 and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. I can now put my bounds in there for my dA. And remember that when I do that, the Jacobian of transformation is r dr d theta. And the last thing I had to do, which I forgot to do, was my curl was 1 plus 2y. y is r sine theta in polar coordinates. And now finally I have this integral. And now you can see finally 
we're computing a double integral in I shouldn't have probably maybe the first time done one in polar coordinates on top of everything, but we had to make the move to polar coordinates and now we're actually computing a double integral and it's Fubini even because it's iterated. <laughs> this is equal to the integral from zero to two pi of r plus two r squared sine theta dr d theta. I could split them or do a bunch of things. I'm just gonna do it this regular way we do. Let's fix theta and do r. Oh, what's wrong with this picture? One of the integrals disappeared. This is equal to the integral from zero to two pi of one half r squared plus two over three r cubed sine theta evaluated from zero to one d theta. We just put the one in there, the zero will kill the r. That's going to give me the integral from zero to two pi of one half plus two over three sine theta d theta which is going to give me, I can sneak it in, that will give me one half theta plus two over three cos theta evaluated from zero to two pi, which is when I do cos of two pi, I get one, and when I do cos of zero, I get one, so I'm gonna get one minus one is zero, so that will go away, and I'm going to get two pi over two, which is pi, yeah. You might want to practice a couple of those. Please subscribe right here, hit the notification bell. We're on the home stretch. We got one more video about divergence theorem and how to connect that. There's a there's a better there's a worse theorem than this one. <laughs> Let's try that next time.